Thank you. Yeah, I'm aware that I stand between you and coffee, so I promise I will be brief. Um, yeah, we at Oxford have had great fun over the last year also getting to know lots of the, the breakthrough team, particularly the breakthrough listening group. Um, and we've had all sorts of interesting and engaging ideas. But sitting yesterday made me think about um, one of my predecessors at Oxford, a 17th century clergyman called John Wilkins, um, who was one of the first people to write seriously about space travel. He published uh, a couple of books arguing that the moon was habitable, uh, indeed, that the moon was habited and that therefore we should go and say hello. Uh, in the first book, he invented a universal language uh, so that he could talk to the people on the moon. I don't know how they were supposed to learn it, but still. Um, but he also had thoughts about how to get there. He thought you should go to the moon in a, a sort of chariot with an open top so that you get a great view. Uh, and this thing had a large rotating sail. Um, so perhaps there is precedent for some of what we said yesterday. He also, uh, the footnotes of this book are brilliant. He notes that um, though the voyage will be long, we don't need to worry about food because as we know, uh, gravity doesn't exist more than a few miles above the Earth's surface. And without gravity, your food is not pulled through you. And so your stomach will remain full for the duration of the, of the journey. And this is the kind of radical thinking that I, I think we need uh, at this conference. Um, Actually, though, he was also one of the founders of the Royal Society, which, when it was established, was a vehicle for openness and science communication. The world's first scientific journal came out of that Wilkins and his friends and their efforts to spread conversation about what they were doing. And I think that's very much the spirit of this meeting, where I've talked to philosophers and engineers and scientists and all, all sorts of people. And I want to just spend two minutes um, trying to put in your heads the idea that this openness open to conversation, but also open to the world, is something that's really important for our science and our projects in particular. We're really lucky in that the stuff that we do, whether it's listening for aliens or thinking about how to build the next generation of pioneering spacecraft, are things that are inherently interesting to almost everyone on the surface of this planet. When I worked at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago, the number one reason for visiting well, actually, the number one reason for visiting was that the queue for the aquarium was too long. Uh, but the number two reason for visiting was that people wanted to talk to an astronomer. Um, and while I love my friends in condensed matter physics or, or you know, advanced genetics, that's not the same reaction for other cutting-edge fields. So we can take advantage of that. In my own work, I run the Zooniverse Citizen Science Platform, which has a couple of million people helping us classify galaxies, discover planets, and count penguins, uh, amongst other things. Um, but we've also seen across the sciences that openness can change the science that you do. There's a really good case study from um, the Kepler mission, which found so many of the planets that we're now thinking about investigating. And for the first few years of its life, in its planned mission, Kepler was a traditional science mission where the data went to the science team and they exploited and published it. For its extended missions, the, the so-called K2 mission, um, the data was almost immediately open. And you can see that what happened was that not only during the extended mission was Kepler more productive, but the type of people publishing uh, and using that data changed. It became open to a more diverse set of collaborations. Um, people at a more diverse range of institutions were able to contribute. And we see this pattern again and again. When Steve Squires, the principal investigator for Spirit and Opportunity, the first really capable Mars rovers, made a decision to make the images available online as they came down from the spacecraft, um, a global community of enthusiasts, many of them with their own technical skills, were able to take those images and use them to tell the story and the science of the exploration of Mars. So openness can transform how we do science, but it can also change what kind of science that we're doing. Um, and this is a quite a strange argument to make at a closed workshop, uh, shut away here, away from the world. But I still think that we can take the spirit of the conversations that we have here back into our own research and our own engineering and our own science. And if we think a little bit more like John Wilkins and not be afraid to take seemingly crazy large ideas and tell the world about them, I think we can have a transformative effect uh, on our communities and on the rest of the planet and get the adventures that we want to have together underway. Thank you very much.